And this morning, it is our privilege to have a guest speaker, and I think Wayne is going to come up and introduce him. I am. Thank you very much, Daniel. Great to see you all in the hall and those that are joining us online for this very special celebration of the blasting of the trumpet yeah, and the announcements that go with that. It's been glorious worshipping the Lord together this morning and uh, we are, as a church, we're actually, I feel that we are very honoured to have Pastor Peter Sukahira from Mount Carmel Assembly in Israel with us as our guest speaker. And would you welcome Peter as he comes to the platform? <laughs> oh. And uh, we bless you, and Peter, we welcome you in the name of the Lord, and I would like to pray for you as you begin. Your... Father of glory, we're all your children, and we stand as your family together this morning, and we praise you that you are, for all that you are doing across the earth, Lord, we thank you that you are continuing to do, Jesus, what you said you would do, which is to build your church and not even the gates of Hades are standing against that reality. And so in all sorts of ways you're doing that. And we thank you that you're doing that here in this region, in and through us as a people. And we thank you for sending Peter to be here today to speak to us. And Father, we pray that prayer that Paul prayed as he wrote his letter to the Romans... And he longed to come to them and see them and to be a blessing to them, but he also wanted them to be a blessing to him as well. And so, Father, I ask that this will be a mutual blessing for us and Peter this morning. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Welcome, Peter. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'm uh, very, very happy to be here. Uh, I already feel the presence of the Lord and uh, your wonderful warm welcome and, and this uh, really the depth of your worship. I can just, I, I feel right at home. I'm uh, really, really blessed. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Daniel. You're, uh, you're, it's a very uh, great privilege to be here. Okay, my name is, is uh, Peter and um, I'm a Japanese American Israeli. Okay, this is a, a minor correction, I think, from uh, a week earlier. I, uh, I've got a Japanese-looking face, uh, an American-sounding voice, and an Israeli passport. <laughs> so uh, my wife, uh, I'm from a Japanese-American background, and uh, my wife's from a Jewish-American background. We met in university actually more than 50 years ago. We came to the Lord 50 years ago this year. And we're married the next year, so next year will be our 50th wedding anniversary. And uh, God opened the doors for us after uh, calling us to a marriage and ministry in Israel uh, so many years ago. He opened the doors for us to uh, go to Israel as immigrants in 1987. So we've been uh, in Israel for 35 years, Living as uh, citizens, our two children have grown up in Israel. Uh, we've got three grandchildren uh, by now. And uh, all of our time has been on Mount Carmel in the city of Haifa. And in uh, 1991, we were privileged to join with another couple, David and Karen Davis. Uh, and uh, we founded a messianic congregation on the top of Mount Carmel. This was a congregation reaching out to Jews and Arabs started as a uh, kind of an ex extended Bible study, and now we've grown into a network of ministries that reach out to our city. Uh, God has been very gracious, but we realized that we caught a wave of, uh, of transformation and restoration that God had been intending uh, for, uh, for, from long before to bring to the land of Israel. And uh, we found ourselves as part of that first generation of uh, congregation builders who were able to see uh, visible and viable uh, Israeli congregations uh, in the land of Israel, really for the first time in 2,000 years, to be a part of a community that is 
uh, worshiping Yeshua in his own land, among his own people, in his own language of Hebrew for the first time since the book of Acts. Uh, it's really been a thrill. It's uh, not been easy. Uh, it's, uh, it's always, uh, you know, what we say in Israel is there's never a dull moment. You know? <laughs> It's always been challenges. We have enemies from without. We have enemies within. We've got uh, political struggles. Uh, we've got cultural struggles. We've got religious struggles. Uh, and uh, so it's been a, a growth process. And uh, this morning I want to share with you uh, some of those things. I do bring you greetings from the Carmel congregation, from uh, my wife Rita. Actually, she's with her mother, who is uh, 99 years old, in Boston. She'll be turning 100 in December. And uh, so Rita, Rita's there uh, with her uh, for, a, for a few weeks, and we'll come back to Israel after the holidays. And uh, from uh, Danny and Luann Syag, some of you know uh, Pastor Danny, uh, from Karen Davis and others on our, on our leadership team, we send you a warm shalom and shana tova uh, from the land of Israel. Now, of course, this is, this is the, we're in the, the Feast of Trumpets, or we've just passed a Feast of Trumpets, and uh, you probably all know that uh, traditionally we call this the New Year, uh, Rosh Hashanah, and uh, so it's uh, the beginning of the traditional New Year in uh, Israel. We have at least three New Years in Israel. We have the Biblical New Year, which is uh, Passover, uh, we have the, the civil new year, which is January 1st, that we share with the rest of the world. And then we have the traditional new year, which is now. So <laughs> there are probably others. Actually, I think there are other uh, new years. Uh, could I ask you to turn this down just a bit uh, in the back? There's a, there's a, a kind of an, an echo. And um, so this is, this, is, this is the new year, the Feast of Trumpets. And because we've passed from, uh, from the beginning of Rosh Hashanah, uh, these are the 10 days of awe, okay? Or the Yamim Noraim, uh, the, you know, literally in Hebrew, the, the terrible days, okay? Because it opens up those days of introspection and we're, we're urged uh, by the biblical calendar to uh, look inward, to take account of the things that we've done wrong, the sins that we've committed over the previous year, because this is the, these are the 10 days leading up to the Day of Atonement, okay, Yom Kippur, which will actually be a week from today, uh, Yom Kippur, 10 days after uh, Rosh Hashanah, and on Yom Kippur, biblically, that would be the one day of the year when the high priest would go through the veil from the holy place into the Holy of Holies, where uh, there was nothing, uh, this was the innermost sanctum of the, of the temple, and in that, in that room there was no light uh, except for the presence of God. There was, uh, there was the Ark of the Covenant and Aaron's rod that had budded and, uh, and uh, just the presence of God, and the high priest would go in, into that room once a year, one person once a year would go in for the purpose of sprinkling the blood of the sacrifice on the mercy seat uh, that was atop the, uh, the Ark of, of the Covenant to atone for the sins of the nation. Uh, and uh, so, so the people uh, would, would repent of their sins during the first, uh, during the 10 days of awe. And then, uh, and it says, the scriptures say, afflict yourself on uh, the, the day of atonement. Okay, uh, that's uh, been open to interpretation for centuries and actually for thousands of years. Today, Jews fast, okay, from, from the evening before to the, uh, till when the sun goes down on Yom Kippur. And then the trumpet is blown. Okay, and uh, during that day there are prayers and, and, uh, and uh, services, but the trumpet is blown at the end of Yom Kippur to signify that the gates of righteousness now have opened, the sins of the past are now forgiven, and we go forward. And uh, it's a day of, it's a Shabbat day, it's a day of total rest. Really, it's a picture of the grace of God. Okay, God says, okay, you take account of your life of, for the past year, and then on, the, on Yom Kippur, you do nothing. <laughs> you do nothing, and at the end of the day, I forgive all your sins. All right, it really is a, pic a picture of grace. That the, you know, the, the Shabbat was, was meant to be the grace of God. We stop, and, and uh, he provides everything that's required. And Yom Kippur is a special uh, Shabbat, uh, and a special day of, uh, of rest, and that's coming up a, a week from today. 
So trumpets uh, that we're in now, this, this Feast of Trumpets, very, very important. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a, a list of some of the, the uses of trumpets in the Bible, so to kind of uh, orient you to, uh, to this, uh, this time of year. Oh, but actually, before I do that, I want to tell you ab about, uh, about this message that I, that, I, that I have prepared for you. It's about the kingdom of God and about being, uh, becoming uh, high-quality disciples of the kingdom. And uh, the reason I'm here in Perth is that I was invited to be a speaker in a discipleship conference that's uh, uh, being held annually at a, a large, uh, mostly Asian church called Faith Community Church in Perth. Uh, the pastor there, Benny Ho, has been my friend for, for many years. And this year, he invited me to come and speak at the discipleship conference. And there's been kind of a convergence in our, in our paths. Uh, he's gone from, uh, you, you know, most, uh, most Christian churches go from uh, uh, repentance, conversion, prayer for salvation, baptism. Uh, okay, you join the congregation, and then you become a disciple. All right, and that's the, that's the traditional path. I've come to disciple kind of the long way around. I, it was like uh, after being in Israel, God gave us a download of the revelation about the significance of Israel, why Israel is so important, why God has chosen our generation to bring the Jewish people back and establish this nation after 2,000 years of wandering and, and why we caught this wave of, of, of being among the first people to, to effectively bring the gospel back to the people who wrote the book, okay, to the place in which it was written. Okay, after nearly 2,000 years of, of absence, now th both of those things are taking place. So that great revelation really illuminated our lives for so many years. That led me to a restored vision of what is meant by God in the scriptures by the kingdom of God. What, it really changed my whole paradigm in terms of what I thought was the kingdom of God. And that in turn led me to ask the question, Lord, so how do you want your kingdom to come to earth? How does your kingdom come to earth? And uh, uh, just a few years ago, I really came to the conclusion that the way the kingdom of God comes to earth is through discipleship. It's through, it's through the, the, the changing of our characters as, as we, we come into the presence of God, as we feed on his word, as the Holy Spirit does that, that work within us, we are changed. We don't remain the same. We're changed. And as we change, the kingdom is being established in us. And that, that, that character change, that discipleship, that maturity is what we need to take out of the church into society, and that's how the kingdom of God comes to earth. So these are, these are, that's, that's my message. I, I'm done now, okay? We, we, can, we can pray. Now, actually, what I'm going to do is I'd like, I'd like to, in the minutes that I have, talk to you about that, that, that one shift, how Israel led me to understand what is the kingdom of God. But first, tabernacles, feast of trumpets. Trumpets are used in the Bible. They, they announce, they're like the, the they, they announce the voice of God. God is going to speak, so you blow the trumpet, okay, and it, and it kind of opens our spiritual ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Uh, a good example of this is Moses getting the law on Sinai, okay, it's accompanied by trumpets, okay, you know, there's thunder, there's lightning, and trumpets, okay. Trumpets also signify for us biblically victory, victory over the enemy and supernatural power to overcome the obstacles and the enemies that we face in life. Uh, Joshua, okay, the classic example, Joshua at the Battle of Jericho, okay, he's told you take the trumpets, okay, seven trumpets, and you take it around the walls of this, this enemy stronghold seven times, and then on the, on the seventh time, they blow the trumpets, and the walls, of course, fall down, and the battle is won. So this is, uh, you know, a picture of the spiritual strongholds in our lives and the, the, the trumpet uh, signifying the power of God to defeat our enemies. Okay, it, the trumpet is used throughout the Bible to call the people of God together, often uh, together for battle, as in uh, Gideon in the days of Judges. Okay, he blows the trumpet uh, in, uh, in the territories of, of, of the tribes, and the tribes gather together to do battle against the Philistines. 
um, assemble the people of, uh, of God, uh, often for war, King Saul, the generals of Israel, they, they, they blew trumpets. Feasts and special days, there were trumpets that were blown to announce the start of the feast and uh, the beginning of the Shabbat. Uh, you know, the Jewish people, uh, they, they've got it down to the minute. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you want to know when uh, when the Sabbath begins on Friday night, you only have to look in the newspaper, okay? Because the, they publish it uh, in the newspapers, okay? The minute that Sabbath begins, and uh, in the days of the temple, they w the priests would blow th the silver trumpets, okay? They would blow the trumpets to announce the feasts, you know, from the the highest uh, corner of the of the temple on the Temple Mount. Uh, actually, they, the archaeologists found that stone, okay? The temple was taken apart uh, af after the days of Jesus, just as he had predicted, stone by stone. It was, it was dismantled by the, by the Romans. But in the rubble, in modern times, they found the corner piece at the very top of the wall, okay? And it says, from the place of the blowing of trumpets, okay? So, so we know that that's where the priests would go to the corner of the top of the temple building, and they would blow the trumpets that would announce the beginning of the Shabbat and the beginning of feasts. Um, trumpets uh, signify an open heaven, okay? Uh, very often, trumps, trumpets will be blown prophetically uh, to open heaven as at the end of Yom Kippur. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, this is something, it's, it's so deep, in the heart of, of Jewish people, you know, the sound of the trumpet and the Sharei Tzedek, you know, the, the gates of righteousness, okay, are, are opened. Uh, when you hear the trumpet sound, you can go, okay, <sighs> I'm ready for the next year. You know, <laughs> the, 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 my sins have been washed away. I mean, this didn't originate with Jesus. This was part of the, of the revelation that was given, given to Israel, uh, at atonement uh, through the blood of the sacrifice. He just personalized it, you know, and brought it to its perfection and its intensity and brought it to all the world, uh, not just to the people of Israel. And then, of course, uh, trumpets signify the judgment of God and the great and terrible day of the Lord. Because, you know, we know that when, when Yeshua came uh, the first time, he came as a suffering servant, okay? He came uh, and, and humbled himself and took upon himself the you know, the, the appearance of, of man. He became, uh, he became a human uh, to be the sacrificial lamb, to, be the, to lead the kind of life that, would, that was uh, love and compassion, humility and meekness, and in the end, give up his life, uh, uh, you, you might say, surrender to injustice on our behalf uh, so, so that his life would be taken and his blood would be shed, his body would be broken for our sake, and we just celebrated that and remembered him uh, because of the sacrificial uh, and meek life that he lived. Uh, but when he comes back, he's not coming back like that. <laughs> you know, he's coming back as conquering king, uh, and he will rule the nations, and he will judge every sin, believe me. Uh, it's good to take advantage of the Day of Atonement. <laughs> <laughs> while we're on this earth, okay, and grab a hold of the atonement that we have and the forgiveness that we have continually for the, for the sins and, and the, the injustices that we commit, okay, because it's, a, it's preparation, because when he returns, it's game over, right? It's, uh, you know, and, and he will bring every sin to justice. He will right every, every, every wrong thing, uh, and it's not going to be a good day for a lot of the world. Uh, that's why the Bible calls it the great and terrible day of the Lord. And that is signified by the blowing of trumpets, okay? It's like the trumpets signify we're in the end times and we're looking forward to the, to the, the, the great, the final trumpet, okay? When the final trumpet is sounds, it, it announces the, the judgment of the world and the vindication of the righteous. And God establishes his kingdom on earth um, and uh, we have a picture of this. Uh, if you read the book of Revelation, there, a, there, there are so many verses on the trumpets. The angels sound these trumpets, and they are, they are judgments on the sin of the world. And so we live in a dark world. We live in an in, unjust, unjust world. We live in a world uh, characterized by, by brokenness and sin. But when the Lord returns, he sets everything right, and he makes everything new. And those of us who have been washed in the blood of the Lord uh, and have learned to walk with him 
uh, it's going to be a day of vindication and reward and rejoicing like uh, we can only imagine at this point, okay? Just wild rejoicing, okay? <laughs> and uh, incredible, uh, eternal uh, uh, joy and, and, and freedom that we only taste uh, in, in an earth, earthly way uh, in this life uh, when uh, anointed worshipers worship, where you get a sense of the, the depth, the love, and the, and, the, and the grace of God. But when he returns, it's going to be magnificent beyond description. Uh, and that is heralded by the trumpets of God. And so when we blow the trumpets, we're looking forward to that day. We're announcing, we're pre-announcing that. Uh, let me just read to you from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. You know, there's like three or four times uh, this morning uh, in these few minutes, I'm going to quote to you from the, from the Bible. I should have submitted them as slides, but just listen, okay? Because I'll tell you, when I'm quoting, it's just exactly uh, the words of Scripture. This is 1 Thessalonians 4.16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. That's a lot of comfort for older people like myself. You know, we're, <laughs> you know it's like, you know, they, where they, you know, you're in the elevator and these young people get in and then it comes and the door opens and they go. <laughs> 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 okay. All right. So it's, it's a picture of the coming of God's, God's kingdom to earth. And there's an already already and not yet aspect to God's kingdom. We already have God's kingdom. We've already entered God's kingdom, but there's also a not yet. There's an expectation of the kingdom coming. It's both. It's not one or the other. It's both. Because the kingdom of God is wherever and whenever God rules as king. It's his domain. So when, when by, the, by, by faith in Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit, you submit your life to the rulership of God now, which means that the Holy Spirit is living within you, and when it comes time to make a decision, you might have ideas, you might have uh, desires, you might have pressures, you might, okay? But, but you submit that process to God, okay? And, uh, and you come before him and say, Lord, the, here are my options. Here's really what I'd like to do. Uh, here's what these other people want me to do. Uh, you, know, you know the situation, uh, I, but you have the last word. Whatever you say, that's what I will end up doing, okay? Uh, I honor you. Okay, that's, that's the kingdom of God, okay? Because you're saying, my life, that decision now is under your sovereignty. I use my human free will that you've given me because you made me in your image. I, I, I have free will, and I can't escape from that. That means I have the, the freedom to do as I like, but I also have the responsibility for what I do. So by my free will, I come under your sovereignty. I honor you as king. You tell me what I should do. I'll get it done. All right? That's the kingdom of God. And when that's the case, then you can say, the kingdom of God is within me, all right? Because he's ruling. That's where he's ruling in there, okay? If uh, in, in your marriage, you and your husband or your wife, you, you, you have family decisions to make and you get together and you, and you pray about them and you lay them before the Lord. And like that, you say, okay, this is what I want. This is what he wants, she wants, okay? The family wants, the, you know, this is our financial situation, all of that. And you bring it to the, to the Lord and you say, but Lord... You are, you are king in this home. You're king of our family. You're king of our marriage. You tell us what to do, and we'll find a way to get that done. You have the last word. Okay, then now you can say, the kingdom of God is coming to my home. Okay, He's, we're, we're giving him, we're offering to him uh, that, our, uh, that will, and so then he has the sovereignty, and he's taking responsibility. Now, that's the, the power of the kingdom is coming to my home. If that's true in your business, if that's true in your ministry, uh, th then the kingdom of God, I think you get the idea, then the kingdom of God is already, already. But nothing will ever be perfect until he's here. And when he's here, okay, he will rule with perfect righteousness. And we look forward to that day because there's, there's a lot of problems we're never going to solve in this life. 
happen, okay? There's a lot of things that, that, that just, just are, are, it's something we want to see and maybe, maybe it's, we're, we're, we have to just be patient and wait, wait on the Lord, but he will bring all of those things to, uh, to fulfillment. That's the already and not yet. So it's important to understand what is the kingdom of God. Now, many of us, if we, uh, if we read the Bible carefully, it's uh, clear to us that the kingdom of God was the primary message of Jesus. He, uh, he, he spoke it, he demonstrated it, he prayed it, he taught it. Uh, he started his ministry with the proclamation, listen, Israel, repent, change your ways, turn around. The kingdom of God is at hand. Uh, he taught his disciples and us to pray. He said, pray in this way, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. At one point in his greatest sermon, some say this is the, was the greatest message that was ever given by a human on earth. They have three chapters in Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest teaching from the greatest teacher who, who ever walked the planet. In, in the midst of that, he said to his disciples, make this your highest priority. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness Everything else that you need will be added to you. Keep that as your priority. Keep that first. When Jesus taught the masses, it was his uh, habit to use stories uh, called parables, little stories from, from life uh, that represented the kingdom of God. And most of his stories begin with the kingdom of God. He said the kingdom of God is like a man who found treasure buried in the field. Uh, the kingdom of God is like a fisherman who threw his net into the sea. The kingdom of God is like a, um, uh, a merchant who went seeking fine pearls. The kingdom of God is like a woman who had yeast and she worked it into a, a lump of dough. Um, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, over and over again, you see this as you follow his, uh, to his teaching and his ministry through the scriptures. This was really his primary message. But because it's so prominent, many of us come away with the impression that it starts with Jesus and that everything we need to know about the kingdom is in the New Testament. And that's, that's kind of how I was for actually a lot of years, okay? Everything, everything I knew about the kingdom was from uh, the words of Jesus, uh, the gospels, and from the epistles, and from the book of Revelation. Uh, it took me a while to realize that that's like coming into a long movie in the middle. If you come into a long movie in the middle, or if you dive into a television series uh, after the first episodes, okay, it, it, you know, eventually you're going to find out how it ends. And if you pay attention, you'll probably be able to figure out who the main characters are and basically what's going on. But you never understand why it ends the way it ends or what's really motivating the people that you're dealing with in this unfolding story because all of that is established at the beginning. So, so it is with the kingdom of God. It doesn't start when Jesus, the king of kings, arrives on the scene and says, repent, the kingdom of God is here. Okay, it starts much earlier, and it starts with Israel. And it's really important to have that, that piece in place because it tells us some, some immensely important things about the kingdom of God. It, it also, I think perhaps most importantly, it shows us that from God's point of view, his kingdom is a society. His kingdom is a society, and the, the, where he wants the kingdom to come is to your nation. All right, for, for many years as a pastor, and I've been, uh, been a believer now this year for 50 years. This is my 50th year as a believer, and about 40 of those were, were in ministry, um, uh, mostly as a pastor. For many years as a pastor, decades, I believed my church was the kingdom, and that my job in extending the kingdom was to get people out of the dark world and through faith in Jesus, bring them into the church. And the way I, you know, and so where they could be baptized, where they could learn the word of God, and uh, I would measure my success simply by the number of chairs we put out every week, all right? And so for, for several decades, you might say I was a disciple of church growth, okay? I, it, and it, it took me a, a number of years, and I don't have time to go into to all the details, 
but I, I began, began to realize that the, the church as, a, as an assembly, as an as a organization, as, a, as a, a, an identifiable body, is absolutely essential in God's plan to redeem the world. But the, the church's main function is to equip the saints for their work of service, and that God intends the church to be his instrument of bringing the kingdom to the world. The church is not an end in itself. The church is actually a process of equipping the men and women, children, who will go out from the church strong enough to be salt and light, to bring the kingdom of God where they work, where they live, where they shop, okay, and, and into education, into science, into business, into government, into, and that's how the kingdom of God comes to earth. And this is why I came to the conclusion late in life, late in my ministry, that God's chosen method is through discipleship. And that the, the chief calling of the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists is to equip the saints for the work of service. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's I'm telling you just in advance uh, where this started, but it started from getting this understanding, what does God consider his kingdom? So it was so prominent in the, in the message of Jesus, but it doesn't start with Jesus. God called Abraham, and out of his call, his friendship with Abraham, he created a people. He calls Abraham and says, Abraham, I like you. <laughs> All right, it was more than that, okay? I mean, this was a man of integrity, a man of faith, a man of loyalty, okay? A man, you know, I mean, he was a, a good man, okay? And it wasn't an accident. God called him, said, okay, if you're willing to leave everything else, okay, come into the land that I'm telling you. Start your life over again. Be an immigrant, okay? Yeah. Start your life over again. I have something very, very special for you. And, and the call included what God has been working, the plan he's been working for thousands of years. He says, I, I will make out of you, Abraham, a great nation. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's my plan. I'm going to make, I, I'm going to create a nation from you, Abraham. If you obey me, if you walk before me uh, in, in faith and integrity, I'll make out of you a nation. And my, my plan is to use that nation to bless all the nations of the world. Okay, so Abraham did that. It was passed on from generation to generation. Israel ended up as slaves in Egypt. Okay, now I'm, that was the first half of the book of Genesis in five seconds. <laughs> right? But I think you're well taught in this congregation. <laughs> you, you know, all right? So they ended up in Egypt. Okay, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob's name is changed to Israel. He has 12 sons. One of those sons, Joseph. Okay, you know the story. All right? They end up in Egypt. They're in Egypt. 430 years, and when they come out of Egypt, they're about 2 million people. They've been slaves for four centuries. They've never owned their own land. They've never governed themselves. They've never been anything other than slaves in anybody's memory. Okay, now they're in the desert, and God appears to them, and here's what he says. Now, I'm going to read to you from uh, Exodus chapter um, 19, verse 6. God ar arrives in the desert. This dysfunctional mass of former slaves. In fact, I was just talking to, to uh, some people yesterday who spent the first year of their marriage in a lot. Okay, this is a pastor in Melbourne. I just met him for the first time, okay? We're getting to know each other. He says, oh, I said, have you ever been in Israel? He said, yes, we, when we were married, and this was like 40 years ago, okay? He said, when we were married, we spent the first year of our marriage in a lot. And I went, why? <laughs> you know, you know, because in a lot, I mean, it's a kind of a resort on the Red Sea. It's where Israel comes down, and it's a, a little, a little resort. But in the summertime, it gets over fifty degrees. I mean, it's really hot. It's the wilderness, okay? Because right, you know, you're 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 right there on the Red Sea, and on one side is Sinai, and that's exactly where they were, okay? So, so God meets these people. They they don't know how to survive in the desert, and He speaks to them. And this is, in short, what he says, Exodus 19, verse 6, And you shall be to me a kingdom, a priestly kingdom, and a holy nation. 
All right, so God says, okay, here's how it begins. Today I become king. If you do what I say, I'll make you the head and not the tail because he's still working the plan that he gave to Abraham centuries earlier, right? He said, I'll make you a great nation, okay? So now hundreds of years later, the people come out of slavery and God shows up and says, okay, we're ready for chapter two, all right? Today I become king. Moses was never king. He was always the prophet of the Lord, the servant of the Lord. God becomes king of Israel in the desert. Therefore, Israel became the kingdom of God. All right, Ta-da! the music should play, you know, the title appears on the screen, the kingdom of God appears on earth. It's Israel. It's Israel. It's a nation. And then God sets them in order. And that's where you get the feasts from. He gives them an entire annual calendar. He tells them how to order business, how to do religion. It's a, it, everything they need, okay, to start becoming a nation. It's, it, it's, it's divine. It's inspired. And, uh, and most importantly, God gets the tribes to agree to be a nation. And I think that's a biblical definition of what is a nation in the eyes of God. It's when the tribes of that of that locality, of that people, agree that they will be governed as one. Then, and when they disagree, a nation falls apart. All right, But God got the tribes to agree as he was king, took him 40 years and a new generation, then they went into the land. When they got into the land, they finally had their own land, they had their own farms, they were able to plant, they were able to harvest, they were, began to prosper, they grew jealous of the other countries around them. They said, why do we have to be such a strange nation? Now that we're settled and we have our own land, okay, they looked around, they noticed there's these other, other nations and they all have human kings and palaces and, and, and honor guards and soldiers and the whole, you know, the whole works. And so they went to Samuel, I'm paraphrasing this, they went to Samuel, who was leading them. He was the great, he was the last of the great judges, the forerunner of the first prophets. He was like a, a giant, a spiritual giant. He was kind of the spiritual leader of Israel in those days. They went to him and they said, they complained. They said, Samuel, we don't like this. Okay, yes, God has been faithful, but we're this oddball nation. We have an invisible king. We have, we have no government. We have no real army. I mean, you know, you tell God we're not happy that we want a human king so we can be like the other nations. And Samuel said, no, no, please, please don't do that. The first thing a human king will do is tax you. <laughs> I, no, I'm serious. I'm paraphrasing, but it's in there. He says, the first thing a human king will do is tax you. Believe me, the flat, 10% flat tithe, it's a better system. <laughs> S stick with God. <laughs> stick with God. The next thing a human king will do, he takes your sons for national service. You know, who do you think is going to pay for those beautiful palaces? You, you're paying for that. Who are those beautiful soldiers in the fine uniforms? Those are your kids. They would have been serving you and, you know, building up your family. Now they're serving him. Stick with God. They said, no, no, no. And so here's what happened. I'm going to read to you the conversation. It's, it's there in the Bible. Just for those of you who are interested, it's 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. Just listen. I'm going to read it word for word. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they've rejected me from being king over them. Okay, so we, Israel, we rejected the kingdom of God. What did we get? Human kings instead. Okay, there's six big books of the, of the Bible that are devoted to the history of the kings of Israel. Okay, and as students of the Bible, I have to say, you need to read all six of those books. But because Wayne and Julie are my friends, I'm authorized to offer you a discount to do it. <laughs> I can sum up those six books in one sentence. How many of you want the discount? <laughs> all right, three of you back there. Okay, that's, that's enough. Okay, here's the sentence. They were a disaster. <laughs> okay, every sin... Every abuse of power, every wrong thing that human rulers can do, it's in those six books, okay? And one of the first things they lost was the unity of the tribes, okay? Then they had two tribes in the south, Judah and Benjamin, ten tribes in the north, and civil war. 
and the ten tribes never had a good king. They were conquered. Eventually, it got so weak, corruption, assassination, uh, it just uh, idolatry. They, they got so weak, they were conquered by their enemies, the Assyrians, taken into captivity, and they disappear. The two tribes in the south, they lasted a bit longer, but the same thing happened to them. A few centuries later, the Babylonians come in, conquer them, take them off into slavery, and for 70 years, God's kingdom on earth didn't operate. And they wept. And then after 70 years, a handful come back with Nehemiah and Ezra. It's really not a triumphant return, if you read the story carefully, because they're never free again. They're under the pagan foreigners. What had been the kingdom of God on earth now is a second or third class vassal state, okay, under the, under the Babylonians, under the Persians. Then they're under the Greeks, and then they're under the Romans. Centuries pass, and the worst thing about it, no revelation, no deliverer, no word from God. I'm sure there were those amongst the people of Israel then who repented, and they said, oh, God, please forgive, please return. What a disaster it was when our fathers forced you to give us human kings. Come back, Lord, come back. And then when things were worst, when things were darkest, a man arises in the Galilee with power from God. I mean, he could do miracles like that weren't even in the Bible. People couldn't, people had never heard of miracles like he could do. I mean, he just speaks a word and the lame open, uh, lame get up and run. The, he, he reaches out his hand, the, the blind receive their sight. He could walk on the surface of water. He could multiply food for the masses. He was like tens of thousands of people began to follow him wherever he went. News like about him went like electricity through the nation. But it was more than miracles, right? He had a message. What was his message? Listen, Israel, turn around, change your ways. The kingdom of God is here. All right, that's where we came into the movie. Of course they knew what the kingdom of God was. And it was so deep in them that it was in the hearts of his disciples and, and this, is, this is kind of what they would have wanted to pass on to us. All right, my time is almost up. Let me ask you a question. If you had five minutes alone with the Lord, okay, five minutes with Jesus, and during those five minutes you were allowed to ask him one question, all right, you won the church lottery or something like that, okay, this is the prize. You have five minutes with the Lord, you can ask him one question. Here's my question for you. What would you ask him? Would you ask him, Lord, when will the Eagles have a winning season again? <laughs> uh, or, or the Dockers even, all right, you know. I, I mean, all right, as important as that is, okay, as important as that is, it's not, as, it's not important enough to ask him. All right, you, you couldn't ask him. You, all right, how about, um, Lord, when will you save my mother? Okay, more important. Right? But you couldn't ask him that. You know why? Because when you finish your five minutes with the Lord, you come out of wherever that is, you're going to immediately be surrounded by a crowd of people, all your friends and family members. And they're going to have one question for you. What's their question? So what did you ask? <laughs> so if you tell them at that point, uh, I asked them about my mom, they're going to be so disappointed, right? They're going to say, you, you, you took your five minutes with the Lord and you asked him about your mother? What about my mother? <laughs> what about all of our mothers? Okay, how could you be so selfish, right? You, 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 so it's not that easy, okay? All right, the reason I'm asking you this is because the disciples of Jesus, they had five minutes alone, alone with him. The last five minutes he spent with them on earth, before he ascended into heaven from the Mount of Olives. They asked him one question. What did they ask him? Well, some of you might know, okay? Others of you might not. This will help jog your memory. Here's part of his answer, part of his answer. But you will receive power 
when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the uttermost parts of the earth. That would be Perth. All right? <laughs> All right? That's, that's part of his answer. First, that's Acts chapter 1, verse 8. So to get the question, let's dial back two verses. Here's their question. So when they had come together, this Acts chapter 1, verse 6, when they had come together, they were asking him, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? That's what they wanted to know. Get the words. Restoring. They knew. Bring it back, right? Are you going to bring back God as king of our nation? Are you going to rule our society again? Okay, that's what we long for, that's what we had, that's what we lost, that's what we want you to restore. Are you going to restore your kingdom to our people? Okay, here's his answer. The next verse is, he said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has put in his own authority. In other words, he says, I'm not saying no, but I'm not going to tell you when. But this is, what I, this is what I will tell you, you will receive power from the Holy Spirit, okay? I'm not saying no, but I'm not going to tell you when. I think it's because if he told them then that it's going, it was going to take 2,000 years, they would have been so depressed. <laughs> right? So wisely, he says, it's not for you to know the times of the seasons, but you will receive power. You're going to be my witnesses. You're going to take this gospel all over the world. Right? That's what he's telling them. Okay? Now, 2,000 years later, we're reading these same words. All right. What do you think he would say if we asked him that same question today? Lord, are you restoring your kingdom to Israel? Are you going to rule Israel and, and make it be an example for all the nations of the world so that, so that they'll, they'll, they'll look at the feasts and they'll, they'll recover the truths that are in the Feast of Trumpets? that they'll understand what it, what it means to have a day of atonement, that every year you promised to forgive the sins of the people if they would just humble themselves and turn to you and then do nothing, <laughs> right? All of this is being restored. What do you think he would say if we asked him, Lord, are you restoring your kingdom to the earth? And are you restoring your kingdom to Israel? You know what I think he'd say today? Yep. Okay, because Israel's back. And I'm here as, as your witness, as a, as a pastor of an indigenous Israeli congregation where Jews, where Arabs are worshiping the king of kings in the land, in the language that he chose. Okay, he's restoring his kingdom to Israel. And it means a big change, a turn for the church. Okay, we restore the kingdom, not just to Israel, we restore his kingdom all over the world and the power of the kingdom. And disciples rise up from our midst and we send them out into the world. All right, let's pray. Lord, I wanna thank you for this wonderful congregation. Thank you for your good spirit and, and your presence that's here in our midst. We wanna honor you uh, as the Lord of the harvest. And we look forward uh, to to blowing the trumpets in Zion, blowing the trumpets of assembly, blowing the trumpets and calling your people together, blowing the trumpets that open the heavens, that, that announce the victory of God over the strongholds of the enemy, and blowing the trumpets that, 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 that look forward to the great trumpet when you return. We, we pray, Lord, that you'll anchor these truths in our hearts. We thank you for your goodness towards us and, and for ruling over us as our as our God and as our King. Thank you for planting these seeds in our hearts so they can never be taken away. Uh, we pray this in the name of Yeshua. Amen. <laughs>